I'm Arthur Cataldo, I'm the facilitator of the Mountain Light Network, and welcome to the first Mountain Light Network meeting of 2018. The second, actually. <laughs> Bob Vitale did a, a wonderful uh, talk and pipe ceremony this morning in honor of the solstice, and I used it as a meditation for peace on the earth, and I just want to extend that for a theme for our meditation. So if you'll close your eyes, take a deep breath, breathing in peace, light, and love, exhaling any mental tension, releasing tension from your neck, your head, and your shoulders, allowing your shoulders to sag and droop comfortably. And take another deep breath, breathing in peace, light, and love, exhaling any physical tension from anywhere in your body, letting it flow through your hands and your feet and out through the top of your head. And just let the back, your back sink into the back of your chair. Let your feet find a comfortable place flat on the floor, connecting to Mother Earth, feeling nurtured and connected to that source of all life. And take another deep breath, breathing in peace, light, and love. And let your body find a nice, comfortable rhythm of breathing. As we say, beloved Mother, Father, God, Holy Spirit, Great Spirit, be with us now and fill us, surround us, and protect us with your light. Make us mindful of the promise of peace on earth. And imagine, if you will, a point of light in the center of your chest, in the center of your heart. And as you breathe, see that light begin to grow, getting bigger and bigger, totally surrounding the space around you, touching the light of those sitting next to you. So we're emerging as one. One light. One love. One being. We are all light. And see that light continue to grow surrounding this whole building, enveloping this building in a blanket of love and peace and harmony. And see that light continue to grow surrounding the city of Franklin, filling it with love, peace, and harmony. And continue to let that light grow, filling the whole state of North Carolina filling it with the light of balance, harmony, peace, and goodwill. And continue to let that light grow surrounding the entire country. As we send out our love and thoughts of healing, To heal the divisiveness, the bigotry, the unbalance that we see reflected often these days. And let the light of peace, harmony, and love surround and fill this entire country and let it continue to grow surrounding the entire planet. One planet, one light, one love. And so it is. And slowly bring your thoughts back closer to home, back into this room, back into your bodies. Feel your breathing, 
through your nose or your mouth, the rising and falling of your chest or abdomen. Feel the connection of your back against the back of your chair, the connection of your feet with the floor of this room. And taking all the time that you need, slowly bring your awareness back into the present and open your eyes. Thank you. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Hugh Lovell, who is a farmer, an international consultant to dairy farmers, graziers, broad acre grain growers, and fruit and vegetable producers. He is the author of A Biodynamic Farm for Growing Wholesome Food and Quantum Agriculture, Biodynamic and Beyond. I asked Hugh if he brought books with him, and he said that he did not, but he would be happy to take orders and, and mail them to you. Initially, Hugh gained 30 years of broad experience in biodynamic farming while operating a market garden farm in the first CSA in North Georgia. His farm was home to the annual Southeast Biodynamic Conference for 12 years. Hugh migrated to Australia in 2006 or 2005 to teach and consult and write. He now divides his time between North Georgia and Australia. Hugh served for six years on the National Board of Biodynamic Agriculture in Australia. He and his wife, Sharbury Bird, are the founders of Quantum Agriculture Consultancy. Please help me welcome Hugh Lovell. So I've uh, I got into agriculture just in a mysterious way. I had no idea that when I was studying biochemistry that I would ever farm or have anything to do with agriculture. But when I'd gotten out of the Air Force this is back in the Vietnam era, then I thought, I want to learn about life. This is enough learning about death. I wanted to learn about life. And I thought, biochemistry, I will learn about the chemistry of thought and emotion. The chemistry of boy meets girl, what could be more interesting? Uh, but actually, I was disappointed. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, a shock to me in my junior year to realize that we weren't studying life at all. We were killing everything that we studied, taking it apart, analyzing it, and there was no life left in it. And so I switched my studies to to psychology and there is no psychology to a corpse so we never studied anything that wasn't alive and because I got involved in biofeedback research then I found out a surprising amount about the physics and chemistry of living organisms, particularly human beings. So, in my work in agriculture, as uh, Arthur said, I'm an international consultant and I've taught courses in Europe, in, in South Africa, in Australia, etc. What I've found is the hardest thing for growers to do is to change their mindset. So, 
I've got to point to the computer, I think. <coughs> so that's the first slide. When changing agriculture, the hardest part is changing your mindset. And really, when it comes to the problems of agriculture, the grower is the problem. <laughs> and growers have obstacles. Needless to say, there's a great deal in agriculture that is about dealing with those obstacles. But the obstacles aren't just diseases and weeds and, you know, insect pests and so forth. The obstacles are things like the blame game. And the blame game is the ticket to helplessness. If you want to be a victim, just blame it on something or someone. Some of the popular excuses. It's impossible. You can't do that. Or, you don't know how. Or, there's not enough time. We've got to do the, we've got to get rid of these weeds yesterday. We, we can't mess around with uh, any other solutions. We've got to have something that nukes it right now. Or there's not enough money. Or it's too risky. Or it's just luck anyway. And there's a lack of will that goes along with this. And people can't find a way to understand how to work with nature. You have to understand how nature works. Because nature's going to work with you or without you. So it's a bit of a puzzle. Nature's an open book, but you don't know how to read it. So you can't find a way to do these things without all those problems. And on the other hand, I'm here to tell you that yes, you can. And you can be creative about it. Now, when I started farming, I had already poisoned myself enough in the chemistry lab classes that I knew full and well that I wasn't going to use poisonous chemicals on my farm. So I started out with the idea of organic farming. And it's not too hard to imagine that before the 20th century, it was all pretty much organic. So we can, we can't go back to anything. Now, you know, <coughs> progress is always into the future. But we could see that back then thousands of years of agriculture were strictly organic. But one of the most important things to learn is to learn how to learn. If you learn how to learn, now this is not something they teach you in school. You know, we had study halls when I went to school, and they were just for making paper airplanes and rubber band, <laughs> <laughs> you know, things and and so forth. And there was there was not a whole lot of study going on, and we didn't have any courses in study. We didn't even have a definition of what study is. And I made the unfortunate mistake in my eighth grade math class when the teacher gave us a half an hour lecture about how we had to study and I raised my hand and said, Miss Hood, what's the definition of study? And that threw her for a loop. And I was on her list after that. Uh, so, one of the things that I found out in my study of psychology is that concepts occur before perceptions do. 
that until we have some concept of something, we can look right at it and we won't see it. So, concepts come before our perceptions. If you survey your actual resources, you can make your own luck. You know, I've heard this on many occasions, oh, he's a lucky farmer. And if you look deeper into this, those lucky farmers have made their luck. I play backgammon, and the way that you play sets it up so you maximize your options. And farmers have to be pretty good at this, maximizing their options. Because, man, they don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The weather and all of these things are changing all the time, and it gets pretty unpredictable. But you're lucky if you're prepared for whatever could occur. You can optimize your options, as I say, and seize your opportunities. But of course you have to realize it's an opportunity before you can seize it. And in many cases, farmers are actually wasting their opportunities. Uh, one of the dairy farmers I worked with uh, decided he would go for biodynamic certification. And he had this particular kind of weed in his field. This was in Australia. And so what could he do? So he chopped it for silage and fed it to his cows. And he turned what was a problem into a resource. The buck stops with you because you're the one that does things. So whether you're doing something beneficial or harmful, it's you that's doing it. You are your final authority. So it behooves you to find out all you can and be an informed authority. To help memory know and act on the truth. You've probably heard the saying that liars have to have good memories. But lying is one of these things that messes up your memory because you've made up a story that doesn't have anything like the sort of uh, background or the way of accessing it that we have about our the facts of our existence. So to know and act on the truth really makes the memory work better because the memory doesn't have to work so hard. Learn to prioritize. Keep an open mind. Reward character. And see deeper than appearances. If we did that in our social life, then this could be very powerful. Our prejudices get in our way. Know your essential beliefs. What is it that you believe that you have to believe to make sense out of life? And learn to question these beliefs. One of the things that we did in our biofeedback psychology research was we found that in defining terms, everybody had beliefs about what was necessary to believe to define or give meaning to a word. And so we would draw these out of the client and write them all down. And then the next question of, what beliefs are not necessary to define or give meaning to the word? And quite commonly, people realize that those beliefs that they believed were necessary weren't necessary at all. That they had beliefs in the way of seeing what was really going on. You need to know your assumptions. 
and you need to question your assumptions. Now I grew up this way in, in our family. Dad believed that we had to question authority. And on one occasion when it actually froze in Hammond, Louisiana, which is where I grew up, then we kids were out spraying the, the sidewalk down with water to turn it into a skating rink. And my mother came out with some laundry and slipped and fell and she told Dad, and Dad said, there will be no more of that. Well, it was the first opportunity we'd ever seen in our lives. And so after an hour or so, we were back at it again. And so Dad had a razor strop in the bathroom and he said, go in there and wait. He would always get his own reactions under control before he administered punishment because he didn't really want to injure us. But he wanted it to be memorable. And so we'd get to, we'd go wait in the bathroom. And I said, but Papa, you said to question authority. He said, I said, he, you said that rules are made to be broken. And he said, not this rule and not this time. So, there's, you know, you don't just idly question authority. But it pays to question authority. Because so often the things that you're told are actually wrong. And we see a lot of this in agriculture. There's some eternal truths and they are really profound truths when it comes to quantum physics. But they're age-old truths. So they'd be in the Sermon on the Mount. Seek and you will find. Ask and you will receive. Knock and the door will open. If you don't knock, the door doesn't open. So observation is the basis of intelligence. So all your IQ tests are based on testing your powers of observation. And memory is not the problem. The problem is recall. <laughs> so, diversity and cooperation are nature's strategy. Versus the human strategy is uniformity and competition and most of our team sports and all of these kinds of things uh, have that uh, and in their basis our military operations so our human strategy is at odds with nature's strategy where the attention goes the energy flows and this is really fundamental to quantum physics so <clears throat> that's that's one of the one of the things that has to be part of you changing your mind. You have to understand this. Manage for what you want. Don't try to manage what you don't want because where the attention goes, the energy flows. So if you're trying to fight weeds, you're going to have weeds. If you set up your environment to actually produce the food and the abundance that you're looking for, then you won't be growing weeds. Weeds will take a back seat. They'll still be there. Sometimes I advise some of my clients in agriculture, let the weeds go to seed. The seeds will be there in case you ever need them again. Because weeds are nature's way of sopping up loose nutrients that aren't properly uh, involved in the soil biology. They're just floating around loose. So nature's going to grab onto those things and that's what weeds do. So, and we see this in cattle grazing operations and all the rest of that. Don't try to manage what you don't want. And last in this series is 
What are the origins of things? Where does life come from? What we find in agriculture is the big deficiency in every different kind of agricultural uh, fertility effort is the one thing that we're not putting back that we need in great abundance is life. If our fertilizers and our methods don't feed the life in the soil and the life in the atmosphere, then we will have problems. Organization is the basis of life and it's organization that we eat our food for. We excrete what's left over after we've extracted the organization from it, the life force. So we don't eat for the bulk or we'd be whales. We're eating actually to take the energy out of what we eat. So that was the end of part one.